Hi, my name is Pop. I'm making a video here for YouTube that is a letter to Mr. Toyota in Japan, the CEO of Toyota Corporation. This is chapter 48 from a book. Dear Mr. Toyota, I am writing you this note, a personal letter to you, the individual, not the corporation. But wait, let me lead into this letter first and I want to discuss this and give you some background. The last name has a D but they changed it to a T for advertising. When you write the name downwards it is mirror image, bilaterally symmetrical. You can put the letters going down on a pole and I will admit there is a little magic there and inadvertent advertising boost. The Japanese kanji characters are used in Japan in conjunction with a Chinese Han character set, but businesses use Western letters, of course, for international trade. For some reason, the delight of the symmetry of the letters appealed greatly to the Japanese. England and Canada, of course, correctly pronounce the T as a T, but in America we slur our T into a D and pronounce Toyota as Toyota anyway. So insofar as American pronunciation goes, Mr. Toyota got to retain the pronunciation of his name despite the new spelling. I saw a red Toyota micro pickup truck in Kingsville, Texas in 1964 at the farm supply store. It seems too small, but it sure looks well built, don't it? And in 1968 I met a used car guy in Waco, Texas who had a Corona. He was testing the waters, seeing if this new name brand from Japan might be a good sideline. They tell me the rich Japanese guys all got this in here. They wanted me to look at a smaller one, the Corolla, but I told them no, that it was too small, that it will never sell. Toyota and Honda are the two big companies out of Japan and in most ways they are as different as night and day. Both make cars but Toyota but Honda also makes lawnmowers, outboards, electricity generators, motorcycles, that was their first venture, robots, and recently business jets in California. Honda is a great success story but I want to dwell on Toyota and Mr. Toyota. Toyota has stuck with cars, trucks, and forklifts. They specialized in automobiles and it is no coincidence that their cars are the best ones you can buy on planet Earth. The Corolla is known as the gold standard of automobiles and that title has not been bestowed on it for any arbitrary reason. It earned that title the hard way through patient, inexorable, hard work. Even the early Corollas were perfect. They started at the highest possible level, but diligently continued improving them. There are zero compromises in quality and safety. Beyond that, they're also styled in a very appealing manner. The Corolla is a better car in all ways than even the fabled Rolls-Royce. It is better than anything available out of Detroit or Europe. It lasts longer is cheaper to buy, is safer, is less costly to maintain. Its resale value is higher than any car as a percentage of its original cost during any and all particular years of its life. Let me dwell on that. You would be crazy to buy any other car based on price. Some come close, but none are at this highest level of perfection. The Japanese car companies decided each to spin off an upgrade name brand to tap into the luxury car market. Honda came out first with Acura, Nissan with Infiniti, and Toyota with Lexus. Many people do not even know that an Acura is just an overpriced Honda, that Infiniti is just a Nissan with leather seats, that a Lexus is merely a Toyota with burled walnut dash. The luxury cars cost twice or even three times as much for the illusion of luxury. Toyota is a step ahead of the other players and came out with Scion. Still really Toyota, but is lower priced, sold differently, but still the same quality. 
The Scion XB, their experiment into this new foray, looks like an insouciant bread box of a truck, but got sold specifically to young people. It is always sold at the price set on the window. No discount, no haggling. No worry about being cheated on the price. To Toyota's complete surprise and delight, the car began being bought at high rates, not just by young people, but by old boomers. The back seat is larger looking and larger feeling than any car on the road. Its carrying capacity is higher than the Honda Element, ostensibly a truck. Toyota is a very conservative company. Toyota carefully tested the waters slowly, conservatively, for acceptance of their version of the all-American vehicle, the pickup truck. The gradual acceptance led Toyota to come out with their full-sized Tundra and smaller Tacoma, both built in San Antonio, Texas. This foray went head-to-head -head against the Chevys, Fords, and Dodges, and took away a great deal of market share. In Texas, we see a great number of Mexican plates and types of cars not available in the U.S., including the Toyota delivery van, the High Ace. The writing here is on the wall that Toyota will venture also into this market segment, that of the delivery van. Many cars, most of the cars in Europe, have abandoned gasoline and have shifted to the far more reliable and efficient diesel burning engines. Now just as clean as gasoline. Only the government of California and the national government in collusion with environmentalists, unions, and regulators keep the rest of us from driving similarly equipped cars. The California standard encroaches upon the rest of the states. It is highly probable that Washington and Sacramento are both keeping diesels out, not for environmental reasons, but for competitive reasons. Detroit has been unable to make any kind of diesel engine for cars, whereas Toyota and Honda could begin selling them today with merely a phone call. Toyota was the recipient of a feeding frenzy, an accusation of some kind of lethal defect causing runaway cars. At first the stories blamed errant floor mats following the accelerator pedal, then American Automotive Union engineers blamed software, then accelerator pedals made in non-union plants. The news media cooperated fully with the onslaught condemning Toyota Corporation with any kind of fair treatment. There was no real investigation, just fait accompli accusations and not just oft-repeated stories, but constant repeat of the same stories. The news media and Congress started off with the assumption that Toyota was guilty of making unsafe products due to the company not being unionized. I'm going to go out on a limb here personally and assess that the presence of U.S.-style union in a U.S. plant assures that the plant makes a schlockier, less safe, more expensive product than a non-union company. Congress finally hauled Mr. Toyota on the carpet and put him through a humiliating grilling process. Those kinds of inquisitions are what toady congressmen are good at. They are excellent at posturing before nationally broadcast TV cameras. During the Grand Inquisition of Faith, they used to refer to getting the brand of justice as interrogation with prejudice. Mr. Toyota cooperated with full humility. Probably I would not have been so cordial and would have called them out like Howard Hughes did, digging up congressional dirt on deals with Pan Am and its crony deal with the now defunct Civil Aeronautics Board. Hughes was not able to shut down the corrupt CAB in his lifetime, but was able to expose its dishonesty enough for him to start up Transworld Airlines. And all three of them, Pan Am, TWA, and the CAB are now out of business. I would have probably called them assholes and motherfuckers and provided photos of them having doggy style sex with tranny whores paid for by union campaign contributions. 
I would have dug up a paper trail showing that the congressmen were actual union employees receiving more money in cash from that source than from their congressional salaries. How do you think they all became so very wealthy? In the end, not one single Toyota was found with problems. Not even one. Not one instance of failure. Not any, nowhere, no place, under any circumstances. Not just no instance, not even a hint of honest evidence. The onslaught against Mr. Toyota and Mr. Toyota bought a little time for the U.S. unions and the collusion between the current federal government and unions. GM convinced somebody in the administration that they just needed a little more time to get their plug-in hybrid, the Chevrolet Volt, out on the marketplace. After the grilling, the hearing, the insults, the attempt at degradation of Mr. Toyota, not one single Toyota was found to be defective. Dozens of people tried to cash in on the lawsuit. Dozens of congressmen did cash in from the unions, and 435 of them were silent on the issue. No one spoke up for reasonable assessment. It was like a feeding frenzy of sharks. And the sharks have a saying. The only thing you need for an evil feeding frenzy to occur is for good sharks to do nothing. Here then is my letter to Mr. Toyota. Dear Mr. Toyota, I am writing you this note, a personal letter to you, the individual, not the corporation. I wanted to apologize to you on behalf of the American people for the way you were treated by our national leaders. It is dishonorable behavior that we exhibited in the way we responded to the recent news reports of accidents occurring with Toyotas. The whole affair was handled incorrectly and there is no justification for our quick denouncement of Toyotas. We should have investigated further before making summary judgment against you, your company, and your fine products. The calm restraint you displayed during the disagreeable interrogation demonstrates what fine character you possess, and I admire you more than any other man on planet Earth. The history of similar claims, such as the withdrawal of Tylenol from the shelves of stores, should have alerted us of the way in which these news stories grow. The news media acted very irresponsibly in their condemnation to continue their ongoing profits at the expense of yours. It is one thing to report a tragedy and profit from it. That at least is an understandable function of journalism. It is quite another thing to help create the tragedy, to perpetuate it for continued viewership. The collusion between our auto industry unions, left-leaning news media, and left-leaning national government to buy time during our economic difficulties is shameful to say the least. You probably would be the first person to understand that this kind of behavior would not have occurred if the U.S. were not in dire straits due to our own economic mismanagement. But this economic distress is no excuse, no excuse at all for shameful behavior. We lashed out at your success rather than direct anger towards the real villain in this story. And the real villain here is us. We injured ourselves through stupidity, then took it out on you. I repaired cars for 15 years, owned four full-service shops. I noticed I was making almost no money from Toyotas, except for maintenance, regular things like oil changes. I made my money from repairing other name brands, poor quality domestic cars, and although the money was nice, I felt badly for my customers. This eventually led me to buy Toyotas for my own family. Best regards, Pop. There's always more to a story than its veneer. Perhaps GM even quietly approached Toyota seeking a partnership or trade agreement. I can see it now. GM invites Toyota to a meeting in Detroit, perhaps to set up a buyout of a 
new manufacturing facility or something. So Toyota sends the bespectacled Mr. Suzuki and his three assistants. The Americans broach the idea of buying the building as a symbol of a partnership between Toyota and GM to raise much needed capital for GM and try to get the Japs to go for it. There are many advantages. It's in the heart of Detroit. It's already built. The city has lots of workforce already familiar with car manufacturing. Suppliers are all around. Lots of electricity, water, gas. There could be a good tax break. They promise to go easy on the union stuff for a while at least. Of course, you might want to consider going with a unionized workforce. Go with the flow. The Japanese guys look all around at the crumbling infrastructure, the crime. They consider quality control, spaced out workers, slowdowns, strikes, bizarre contract inclusions, feather bedding, dead guys on payroll. One look at the Detroit school system is all it takes. They consider the $80 per hour wages versus their current wage structure in San Antonio. There are puddles of water and dead rats in the corner of the Detroit plant. Winos, guys strung out, guys nodding out, pimps, whores, liquor stores, stewards, grievances, paycheck advance stores, lottery tickets, low-ass fast food places everywhere, and government welfare offices. The negotiation ends with a, we'll think about it. But really, there's no thinking about it required. It would be better to start over with fresh soil without any of the weeds that Detroit and the unions and government have fertilized, cultivated, and harvested for 50 years. You think this is fanciful? This actually happened. We could blame Edward Bernays again. A put-up job with professional witnesses. The profession of journalism reporting. The profession of automotive engineering testifying, the professional legal industry suing, the professional government officials prosecuting, the professional union leaders coordinating the attack. Bernays really, really knew his psychology. How many jobs did Mr. Toyota create in the U.S.? I do not know the number. I would guess it ranges in the several hundred thousand range. It may be in the millions range. The range includes several generations of U.S. citizens from the mid-60s to the present in sales, distribution, manufacturing, repair, design. With a stretch, you could even include the insurance of his cars and people who just buy the cars to further their own non-related jobs. It's hard to define the exact boundaries of influence. How many jobs did the U.S. unions create during those years from the mid-60s to the present? Well, now let's see. They like to feather bed, add dead guys to the payroll, but that actually subtracts employees from the mix. They like to add two or three times as many people as it really takes to get a job accomplished. That certainly adds a job or two. I'll have to give them that. But when you do that, you are increasing the final selling price of the product, aren't you? and the higher priced product probably will sell fewer in number due to increased costs. No. Sorry. Padding the workforce does not increase the overall employment. A unionized workforce does increase the number of people who work directly for unions, arbitration guys, community organizers, politicians. I have to conclude that a unionized workforce destroys productivity, profits, reduces the number of people employed, slows down the economy. Oh yeah. It also makes a schlockier car like Saturn, Fiero, Cadillac Diesel, Pinto, Citation, Vega, K-Car. It would be hard to decide which among these deserves most the Worst U.S. Car Ever Made award. They all deserve it. Meanwhile, people are still driving old, old Toyotas. The only reason people quit driving them is the presence of entropy in the universe. One by one, each old Toyota, sadly, wears out from inexorable aging like the famed one-hoss Shea. 
There's an old poem about a preacher's carriage describing how very well his vehicle was made that it did not wear out piece by piece but rather fell apart all at once, fell to dust where it stood. The Deacon's Masterpiece or The Wonderful One Hoss Shea A Logical Story by Oliver Wendell Holmes, 1809-1894 to Have you heard of the wonderful one-hoss shay that was built in such a logical way? It ran a hundred years to a day, and then of a sudden it, ah, but stay. I'll tell you what happened without delay. And it goes on and on. And my name is Pup, and I thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this.